My name is Ethan, and I'm a photographer. I took a trip last year with my wife to the Colorado mountains for an art project. My wife is also an avid skier, so she talked me into adding skiing into the trip. We had the option to book a room at a ski resort or rent out a private log cabin. The second one seemed more romantic, so I picked that one. Plus, it didn't hurt that it was cheaper. The cabin was nothing luxurious or anything. It was a single floor, four room little thing. A two person bedroom, a small living room, a kitchen and a bathroom. It may have been small, but the actual idea of being secluded in a warm log cabin during a blizzard was amazing. However, the storm was interfering with the cable signal, so we didn't have much to do this one particular evening. It was just starting to get dark out at this point, but there was still a decent amount of light outside, so I thought it would be perfect for getting a few shots and videos in the blizzard for backgrounds and wallpapers. I told my wife I'd be back within 10 minutes and slipped on my boots and coat. The moment I stepped outside and shut the door, I noticed footsteps leading up to the door in the snow that had blown under the wooden awning. I could see the prints doubled, as whoever left them there turned and went the opposite direction. I was freaked the fuck out, but I wasn't about to go inside and scare my wife. I decided to give in to my curiosity and followed the prints to the right side of the cabin. Right away, I noticed that they led to the bedroom window. My heart froze in fear when I saw this. I could see my wife sitting on the bed using her iPad. She noticed me and I waved. She left. I continued to follow the footprints around the cabin to the other side. They led to the living room window on the other side. Someone was stalking us, but how long ago was the question? I found myself standing there for a good minute asking myself if I should follow the footprints anymore. For whatever reason, I decided I would. They were now leading away from the cabin. I knew I was following the prints to where this person was going, not coming from, simply by the boot marks. I followed the prints away from the opening and into the trees. That was where I saw him. A man wearing a black coat facing a tree, slouched down looking at the ground. He was still as a statue, and I could see the snow piling up on his hood and shoulders. I froze in my tracks trying not to make a sound. I would have thought to ask him if he needed help otherwise, but this guy was just standing there not doing anything like some kind of deranged freak. I started to gradually move backwards without even turning around, making sure this man didn't turn around or notice me. When I got out of visual distance, I turned around and stomped through the snow back to the cabin. When I slammed the door shut, my wife came over to see what was wrong. I saw worry in her eyes. I guess she saw the worry in mine. She knew I saw something, and after a few minutes of harassment, I finally told her what I saw. She immediately started packing her things, telling me we are leaving right away. I told her no, we're not going anywhere. I would not get a refund for leaving early, and I wasn't about to up and leave just because some weird guy was walking around outside. She made a point of locking both locks on the door and making sure all of the windows were sealed shut. For the rest of the night, we read stuff on our iPads. I reviewed the pictures and videos I had taken so far. We turned out the lights early as there wasn't much else to do. What if he's still out there? I remember my wife asking me. There's no way he's still out there, I then assured her. Listening to the wind blowing outside, along with the small flakes of snow hitting the windows, was strangely relaxing, and I knew I'd be able to fall asleep quickly. Except, if it wasn't for... The knock at the bedroom window. We were both still awake, and we both knew it was a knock from a person. I ushered my wife out of bed and out into the living room without turning on any lights. There was nothing to use as a weapon whatsoever. Our only option was to run before something might happen. I told my wife we'd have to forget our luggage and make a dash for the jeep. We slipped on our boots and coats in the dark in a matter of seconds, and when we heard a knock at the living room window from the opposite side of our car, we took that opportunity to run. I pressed the unlock button, so grateful I chose to have remote locks on my Wrangler, and we hopped in. The car started with ease, and as soon as the headlights flashed on, the man was standing facing the log cabin on our side now. Not a window, 
just facing the wall of the cabin in the same position I had seen him in earlier, as if he were hiding his face. We drove to the nearby ski resort without much trouble in the jeep. We stayed there for the night and went back the next day to the log cabin to collect our things we left behind. He wasn't there. When I was 17 years old and I was home alone, coincidentally on the night that I tried pot for the first time, I experienced the most horrifying moment of my life. It was mid-December, during a late fall snowstorm. I was in my room with some movie on in the background, Mrs. Doubtfire if I recall correctly, though I wasn't paying attention to it. I was trying to figure out how to properly inhale without coughing. I think I spent about half an hour breathing in smoke from that pipe yet I couldn't even tell if I felt any different. For maybe another 10 minutes, I still continued at it, and finally, I felt a little different. It was a new feeling, hard to explain at the time. I felt as if the room around me felt more calming, and I was more attentive to my surroundings, or maybe less attentive, I couldn't really tell. All I know is I felt different. I was excited, I wanted to keep going. Then suddenly I felt as if I heard a sound come from downstairs. I muted my TV and listened. It sounded like there was a tapping noise coming from the front door, like a light knocking. I got nervous that it was my parents or sister, as I didn't know if I'd be like noticeably acting differently or if they would be able to pick up on the smell from around the house. I headed downstairs and looked through the peephole, not to find my parents or sister, but a severely underdressed, almost homeless looking man. To put this into perspective, we don't live in the kind of suburbs that a lot of you most likely live in. We don't exactly live in a completely desolate area either. We have neighbors, but houses are about 200 yards apart from each other, which doesn't sound like much, but it's a decent distance. So on a dark stormy night like this where we live with some random dirty looking man who I'd never seen before standing on my porch, I naturally pretended I wasn't home. I stood there and kept watching through the peephole as the guy stayed put, proceeding to knock on the door again, this time louder. I knew I wasn't going to answer, so I walked back upstairs to my room and shut the door. In a sense I felt bad, but I would never let a stranger into my house, and I couldn't imagine what else he could have wanted other than to be let in. Time passed as I continued hitting the pipe, getting more adjusted to it and starting to really feel its effects. I felt like my mind was wandering, forgetting I was even laying in my bed, or even in my bedroom for that matter, when there was a loud thud at my window. I jumped up quicker than a mousetrap when I heard it. It sounded like a rock had hit my window. I shut off the TV now, the only source of light in the bedroom. Now it was pitch black. It took me a while to connect this with the man who was at the stoop. He was out there, I was in here, and there's nothing he could do to me, I somehow assured myself. However, being high only made me more paranoid and afraid of every little noise. In fact, I seemed to be more alert to every sound, even the small little house noises like random cracks in the walls. Nothing happened after a few minutes, and being in the pitch black darkness kind of tired me out. That, and apparently I just learned that pot puts you to sleep more effectively than sleeping pills. I awoke some time later, thinking it must have been like 3 in the morning, but I looked at the clock and it said it was only a quarter to 1. I had only been asleep for like 20 minutes. I sat up thinking I heard something from down in the den. I rubbed my eyes, and then remembered the man. My heart started racing again. I was about to get up when I realized something. Across the room, there was something beyond my half-open door. I leaned in and squinted my eyes. There was somebody peering into the room at me from behind the door. I let out the most horrified and gut-wrenching scream possible as the person then emerged from the door and started walking over to my bed in the dark. I, I, I just need a warm place to stay. I had no choice but to shove him to the floor when he made it to my bed. It was then that I realized he was a very skinny and weak man. I was able to drag him up and push him to the front door with force. 
He tried to fight and resist, but he was too weak to do anything. He was crazy. I could see it in his eyes. I shoved him outside and locked the door, and then called the cops. I stayed downstairs where he had broken the glass to get inside, just to make sure he couldn't get back in. When the cops arrived, they found him sitting in my front bushes curled up in a ball. They took him to the station, and he was no longer my problem. So do I feel bad about this today? I guess I do a little. He was undoubtedly crazy, but I don't know how dangerous he was. It was still either way the scariest experience of my life. When I was younger, me and my friends would always have big manhunt games in the snow. This one January night when we were 13 and there was this crazy blizzard going on, we continued our tradition. We had a group of six people playing, three on each team. The game was more or less tag, but it involved hiding and running to an assigned safe point which for us was the front stoop. It was fun in the summer, but the snow only made it so much better, what with the snow adding as a hiding and slowing down factor, hunting down footprints, and even using snowballs as weapons to slow down chasers. It was the most fun game of our childhoods. Until this particular year, things turned pretty bad. It was our turn to hide. I'll give you the names of my teammates to make things more easy to follow. Dan and Christian. Dan hopped the fence to someone's backyard on the other side of the block, which wasn't really cheating as we had no limits with this game. Christian jumped on top of my other friend's shed in the backyard and hid behind the sloped roof. I thought I'd be sneaky and started running all around the backyard to create a seemingly endless trail of footprints. When our friends from the other side of the house announced that they were coming, I had to think quickly. I did something that wasn't too pleasant. First, I signaled for Christian atop the roof to run if I were to run myself, and then I hopped in the bushes and lay flat in the snow. Two of the others entered the backyard and started analyzing the crazy footprint path I created. I knew it would lead to me though, so I had to be ready to run if they got close. They were getting closer to the bushes I was hiding in, so Christian jumped down from the shed into the snow and darted for the front lawn. The two chased after him in both directions. I knew the stoop would be guarded right now, so I took this opportunity to better hide myself. I decided to follow Dan's approach and hopped onto the roof of the shed, then over the fence to that backyard on the other side of the block. I didn't see Dan anywhere though. I looked for his footprints, but quickly found some other kind of tracks in the snow. By the fence were a few boot marks from where Dan must have landed, but then quickly the marks turned to a steady trail of something being pushed or dragged through the snow. I followed the trail to the back door of the pitch black house, and then it stopped. I quickly put two and two together, and my heart sank. I turned and headed back for the fence to hop over and call for my friend's parents, but about halfway across the yard, I heard the sliding door to the house open, and someone wearing a black coat with a hood covering their face emerged and started stomping over to me. I screamed like a girl as I pulled myself up over the fence, just barely making it before he could grab my legs. All my friends came running into the backyard, then shortly after my friend's parents came out the back door. I told them what happened, and the mom phoned the police, while the dad stormed to the other side of the block with a gun and knocked on the door. There was no answer, so he let himself in as we watched. The door was unlocked. He had us wait outside, and within a few minutes, came out with Dan in his arms. He was knocked out. His face looked red and wounded, as if he were hit in the face by a shovel or something. There was no car in the driveway, indicating the guy left when I escaped his yard. He never returned to his house, and I'm pretty sure he's still wanted by police to this day. It just goes to show, anybody out there, even your next door neighbor, may be a predator, just waiting for an opportunity to strike.